like to well, welcome all of you to today's um, webinar. We're going to be talking about new HIV drugs on the horizon. I'll be introducing the presenter in just a moment. My name is Raj Gandhi. I'm at Harvard Medical School, and it's really great to have you all with us today. Why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide? So just as a uh, reminder, here are the uh, uh, members of the board and um, board co-chairs and board members along with their disclosures. So please take a moment to, to look at that. And then these are uh, some additional financial relationships um, for the presenter and for myself, as well as for the planners and for the reviewers. So again, a moment for that. Uh, some CME information, the IAS USA is accredited by the Accreditation Council for CME to provide continuing medical education for physicians. And um, this particular activity is um, designated for a maximum of um, 1.25 credits. And there's the information there. And there's also additional credits around ABIM, nurse contact hours, pharmacotherapy, and pharmacy. And more information can be find, found on the website. We want to Gratefully acknowledge grant support um, from the platinum supporters listed here. Um, this uh, effort is really um, possible uh, in part because of the support we received from from the from the companies listed there. So a little bit of logistics before we launch right in. Um, uh, in terms of navigating the activity, there'll be some poll questions. Um, you will uh, get a separate window that will show the question. Do choose your response for the poll, and then after the poll closes, they'll um, we'll we'll go through what the responses are. Uh, also, as a reminder, um, if there's comments or questions, and we hope that there will be, uh, please do use the Q&A button, and, and that's really the place that, that I'll, I, as moderator, will be looking um, in order to highlight your questions. It's um, Because there will likely be a, a good number of questions, we apologize in, in advance if we're not able to, to answer all of the questions within the time constraints of this activity. Uh, the chat is really uh, there um, for um, uh, discussion with other attendings, but use the Q&A for, for comments and questions that would like a discussion around. So without um, any further ado, I want to uh, introduce our presenter for today, um, probably well known to, to many of you, um, Dr. Melanie Thompson, um, cares for people with HIV in Atlanta, Georgia. She's a member and, and recent chair of the IAS USA Guidelines Panel. She's also one of the leaders of the Department of Health and Human Services ARV Guidelines Panel and a leader of the HIVMA IDSA Primary Care for People with HIV Guidelines Panels. I want to say that I count Dr. Thompson as a, a friend and an inspiration, and so I think um, it's really an honor to be moderating today's session, and I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Thompson for the for the activity for today, and I'll be back near the end to moderate the questions and answers. Over to you. Thank you so much, Raj. Um, what a nice introduction, and it's such a pleasure to be working with you as well, and such uh, a pleasure to have so many people on board here on a Friday afternoon, so thank you for joining us. Um, we, uh, I want to go through a couple of slides here, my disclosure, learning objectives. I, I hope by the end you'll be able to describe some of the new agents in development, the research that lies behind them and new treatment strategies under investigation. So we're gonna start with um, a couple of questions here. And here's the first one. So go ahead and vote whenever you want to uh, as I go through the questions. Which of the following is true? Once weekly lenacapavir, Bictegravir showed 96% viral suppression in persons without prior treatment. B, once daily deravirine is latrivir, 0.25 milligrams, showed a 30-cell decrease in CD4 count at 48 weeks. C, GS1720 is an oral integrase strand transfer inhibitor with a half-life that supports weekly dosing. And D, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, MK8507, caused lymphopenia when given with Islatrovir. So please uh, go ahead and vote. We'll give you just a few seconds here. Okay. And here are the results and a little bit all over the map, which is a good thing for a pretest question. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, go to question number two. 
Which of the following compounds is currently entering clinical trials for HIV prevention? A is lenacapavir and is latrivir. B is MK8527, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. C is MK8507, a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And D is GS9770, a protease inhibitor. I know, lots of numbers and letters. That's what today's going to be, I'm afraid. So uh, go ahead and vote. And let's see what we have. Okay, again, a uh, uh, little bit spread out, which is great. So that gives us uh, a lot of stuff to talk about. So I, I think it goes without saying why we need new drugs. You know, people are doing well in general on our drugs, but not everybody is doing well. And that has to do with tolerability, side effects, um, schedule of dosing, and sometimes resistance to our current medications. So uh, today we're going to have a brief overview of investigational drugs and strategies for HIV treatment. So I'm not going to talk about cure and only a tiny bit about prevention. And so uh, these are some of my observations. Uh, first of all, fewer big pharma companies are in the game these days. And yet there are many new investigational agents, including early phase agents. Uh, we're seeing an emergence of interest in oral weekly dosing, which is new, and an emphasis on longer acting agents, especially parenteral agents to address adherence challenges and pill fatigue. There are rare examples of companies working together, and I'll call out Gilead and Merck in this regard because they have worked together. Uh, and there are lots of exciting things going on. So I'm, I'm really um, uh, excited about today uh, and being able to talk about some of these things. So uh, in 2024 and beyond, we're gonna see a bunch of new things in old classes. So NSTs and NRTIs and protease inhibitors. We're also gonna see new uh, drugs being worked on in new class, in our newest class, capsid inhibitors. And then there are two even newer classes that have drugs in the pipeline in RTTIs and maturation inhibitors. We're gonna see some co-formulations of these drugs. And we're going to see a whole lot of BNABs all trying to figure out where they fit in this. And even on just this slide, there are 23 unique compounds and a lot of possible regimens for daily or weekly oral therapy, as well as injectable therapy every three, four, uh, or six months or longer, and uh, potentially also implants. So let's jump in and uh, talk about one of our old friends, cabotegravir. Uh, now we are looking at an ultra long acting cabotegravir that could dose every four months. And this is a study that was presented at CROI, uh, looking at that four monthly dose interval. And here's a study design. And you'll notice parts A and part C in particular. So I want to talk about part A first. This was subcutaneous dosing with the old cab formulation plus hyaluronidase. And unfortunately, this sub-Q formulation uh, was discontinued because of so many injection site reactions uh, with higher severity and longer duration. So wait a minute, what is hyaluronidase? Well, uh, it's in fancy skin creams, and that's because uh, hyaluronic acid is found in tissues such as skin. Uh, it retains water. It has sort of a gelatinous, slippery quality. But hyaluronidase breaks down hyaluronic acid. It makes fluids thinner, uh, and it enhances absorption. And so by using hyaluronidase, the hope is to give higher doses uh, and, uh, and volumes that would be tolerable. So let's go to part C of this study. 
And Part C looks at different doses of IM injection, uh, and also the sub-Q injection is listed here. Now, on your left, you're going to see a, a PK uh, graph, and the dotted line and the gray represent the old cab. And you'll see that the new cab is represented by uh, the red and the black lines. And then these two lines, blue and purple, are the subcutaneous dosing uh, that is not going forward. So compared to the old cab, you'll see a lower Cmax for these uh, IM doses at 800 and 1200 milligrams. And here all the way out uh, to 48 weeks, you'll see a flatter curve than for the old cab. And here's a PK stimulation. Now this time the ultra long acting cab is gonna be with a black line and the gray. And then the old cab is here in red. And you'll see that this uh, simulation for every four month dosing predicts higher exposure and a two times longer half-life for the long acting cab when given uh, every four months, and also higher trough levels here compared to old cab. So the IM is better tolerated than the subcutaneous, as you can see here in terms of injection site reactions. Uh, for IM, they were mostly grade one reactions, uh, mostly nodules with a shorter duration than with sub-Q. And so this ultra long acting cab is moving into phase one. Uh, now, is latrovir is uh, a new drug, but, but it's been around a long time. It's a nucleotide reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor in RTTI. Uh, it causes delayed chain termination, just like the old nukes, but it also does something different, and it actually inhibits translocation, and that's when the reverse transcriptase moves along the uh, viral RNA strand trying to insert nucleotides to make DNA, and it inhibits that process. Now, unfortunately, in the Islatravir studies, what was seen was a decline in total lymphocyte count. And you'll see these studies for monthly, weekly, and uh, daily treatment. So I wanted to emphasize the weekly treatment, uh, which was um, in combination with MK8506, which is an NNRTI. And the dose of Islatravir here was 20 milligrams uh, on a weekly basis. And you can see that the uh, lymphocyte count declined uh, by about 30, 30 cells. And uh, so this was initially blamed on MK8507 because this was a dose ranging study. But it turns out that it's actually is Latrovir. And the reason that this happened um, appears to be the very high accumulation of the triphosphate formulation that occurs intracellularly. And that occurs for three reasons. So first of all, it has a really long half-life, okay? 191 hours for the triphosphate. And it very quickly is transformed into triphosphate. And not only that, but it persists inside the cell. It has a very long intracellular persistence. And then it is not hydrolyzed the way uh, other drugs are because of a fluoro group uh, that's attached to it. So it really hangs around a long time and that causes um, apoptosis or cell death. Uh, now Merck has worked very hard to try to understand this and try to uh, model the kind of doses that would be um, safe and efficacious at a lower dose without triphosphate accumulation. And you can see on the left, the modeling for the two week, uh, two milligrams per week dose, that's blue. And in the pink, the 0.25 milligram QD dose. And then on the right side, you see that for example, that two milligram weekly dose, actually they predict would have minimal uh, lymphopenia associated with it. This would be in the SWITCH study. And in the treatment naive studies, uh, there would be an increase in lymphocytes, 
with this dose. And that's contrasted with these 20 milligram doses in the pink that really go down rapidly and substantially. So I wanna present the data for you for the Duravarine is Latrovir daily dose study um, 017 in persons who have viral suppression. These are week 96 data and they were presented um, at the European AIDS meeting last year. Uh, I'll also point out that there's another study I'll briefly touch upon in which um, BF-TAF was head-to-head -head compared with Duravarine as Latrovir uh, in people who had not received prior treatment. But O17 is in people who have viral suppression. And you can see that both of the Duravarine as Latrovir groups did very well in terms of viral suppression, uh, 86 to 89 percent uh, HIV RNA less than 50 copies, and no con confirmed uh, HIV RNA greater than 200 copies. However, and remember, this is the 0.75 dose of Islatravir, there was a decline in total lymphocyte count to about 26 cells at 48 weeks, and a decline in CD4 lymphocyte count to about 30 cells here at 48 weeks. And so uh, that was um, disappointing. Um, I want to touch on the outcomes at 96 weeks for the head-to-head -head comparison with um, BF-TAF. And you can see on the left that the responses were pretty good, a lower level, but non-inferior or Duravarine is Latrovir, but on the right side, you can see that uh, because participants were removed because of this lymphopenia toxicity, if you took those people out, then the outcomes were quite similar. So what is going on now? There are a series of studies that are now being looked at uh, with a lower dose of Islatravir. So that 0.25 milligram dose that I showed you is now going to be going into trials, in fact, started in trials last year, so is well along by now. Um, and those are for virologically suppressed as well as antiretroviral naive individuals. And then there's a continuation arm from, for people who were on the previous study. So this is moving along and we'll see where it goes. Now, before we get too far away from the topic, I wanna uh, go back to MK8507 uh, for just a second. That's that NNRTI that got blamed for the lymphopenia of his latrovir. Um, it actually has a name, uh, ulaniverine. Um, and its clinical profile is very similar to that of Duravarine, uh, but it does have a longer half-life of about 70 hours, and that allows for weekly dosing of this drug. Um, the pathways to resistance are similar to those of Duravarine. Uh, drug interactions low, uh, similar to Duravarine, although those studies are still in progress. Uh, and so... Uh, because it got unfairly blamed for lymphopenia, the development kind of stalled on this drug for a while, but it is now being resurrected and being considered for weekly dosing with what uh, the sponsor calls an NRTTI. And here are the data in uh, people with HIV. These are a couple of years old, but these are the data that show um, the decline in viral load. And you can see that it's a substantial decline of uh, about one and a half logs at the higher doses over a seven day period. So this is a good candidate for weekly dosing um, and it needs a partner, um, an NRTTI we're told. Uh, I just want to flag for you that there is an Islatravir pro drug in development in phase one. It is a joint venture between Merck and Gilead, uh, and they are aiming for at least every three month injections with this compound, but we don't have any data yet. So I want to talk about uh, MK8527, which is an oral NRTTI. Uh, like is Latrovir, its active form is a triphosphate. There are not a lot of drug-drug interactions that are anticipated, um, but it has a longer half-life than is Latrovir, and that allows for dosing weekly or monthly. 
And so here are uh, the PK results from, uh, from this study that was presented at CROI. And you can see that the dotted line shows the PK threshold that we're targeting here. Uh, and here at the purple uh, arrow is the seven day time point. And you can see that there are a lot of doses from five milligrams to 200 milligrams that remain above the PK threshold at day seven. And then the multiple dose PK study uh, showed only modest triphosphate accumulation, and we know now why that is a good thing. Um, and they estimated a terminal half-life of 216 to almost 300 hours. So you can see here the estimation um, of, uh, of a 28-day period with uh, dosing uh, at these levels five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 40 milligrams. And another study showed us the changes in HIV RNA after single doses of MK8527. And this shows the potency of the drug. Uh, in trial A on the left, you see uh, this time the dotted line is an indication of a one log decrease in viral RNA. And that was seen at the one milligram dose and uh, was exceeded by three milligrams and 10 milligrams. And then in trial B, actually one milligram did a little better than in the other trial, don't ask me why, um, but also the 0.5 milligram dose exceeded the target. So this looks like it is a potent drug, that it has a long half-life, and uh, it also appears to be safe so far. Remember, these are single and multiple dose studies. Uh, there were a lot of AEs that's common for these studies, uh, but they were mild and moderate uh, at worst and transient. And there were no serious AEs in the single and multiple dose trials. Uh, and I've listed some of the common complaints that you often see, headache, uh, oropharyngeal pain, cough, and so on. Uh, the single dose trial in people with HIV had no drug related adverse events, uh, no serious adverse events, and the most common uh, uh, adverse events are listed here. Uh, again, pharyngitis, um, dizziness, insomnia, headache, these were all mild. Uh, and there were importantly, no dose related changes in laboratory tests, i.e. lymphocyte counts. And so this drug, in addition to being looked at for oral weekly dosing, uh, will be looked at for prevention as monotherapy once a month. And here is the study design for the currently enrolling study, uh, protocol 007, and this is placebo controlled, and it will be um, a comparison of three doses. It's a phase two study. Uh, and Merck calls these lower dose, middle dose, and higher dose, and they've not disclosed what these doses are yet. So this uh, drug, 8527, is being looked at for prevention. So now let's move to lenacapavir. This is a drug many of us are very interested in but haven't even used yet. Um, it's a capsid inhibitor. It is approved for highly treatment experience patients who are having trouble putting together a regimen. It is being looked at also for prevention, and I refer you to the purpose studies, but I'm not going to go through them today. Uh, but we will talk about some combinations with lenacapavir, and those combinations are with islatravir, with bictegravir, and with two BNABs. And I will flag for you also that early in development, there is an oral prodrug of lenacapavir, uh, which is called 4182 at this point, and we have no data to share right now. So just a reminder that lenacapavir has multiple mechanisms of action. It inhibits nuclear transport here in the early stages of uh, the cell uh, life, of the life cycle. It also inhibits virus assembly and release in the late stages and capsid assembly. 
And so let's look at this study of is latrovir and lenacapavir given once weekly. And these are the 24 week results. You'll see that this was done in people with suppressed virus who were taking BF-TAF at the time without any history of virologic failure uh, and no hepatitis B infection, and that's important. We'll come back to that. So uh, these individuals were randomized to that two milligram dose of his latrovir. Remember, we talked about that on a weekly basis, uh, 300 milligrams of lenacapavir, and these are co-formulated, uh, and then um, BF-TAF once a day. And that is designed to go along for 48 weeks, and then people have the opportunity to roll over uh, to uh, open label as latrovir lenacapavir. But these are the 24-week data. And I'll show you first the demographic uh, table. I'm not going to show demographics for most of the studies, but I wanted to call out a couple things here. First of all, good for them. They got uh, a fair amount of diversity in their population, uh, almost 20% women, 35% uh, uh, Black, uh, and 28% um, Hispanic or Latino. But I also want to point out that here they actually call out gender identity. So they mention transgender females and non-binary persons. And you just don't see this enough in clinical trials. So good on them for doing this. It's not that hard. Uh, this should be done in all clinical trials. So here are the 24 week results. Um, and these are the efficacy results. And you can see that the viral load suppression was excellent in both arms, uh, about 50 people in each arm, 94.2%. And there was one individual who had a viral load greater than 50 at the 24 week time point. And you can see that this person actually had some low level viremia when they started on day one, even though they did have suppressed virus at screening. Um, and at week 24, they had 64 copies. Uh, nothing was changed. They stayed on the regimen. There was no emergent resistance detected. And at week 30, uh, the viral load suppressed to less than 50 copies. So this person is still on study. And this is important. The CD4 lymphocyte count and the absolute lymphocyte count uh, really did not differ between the groups. So that is great news for this dose of Islatrovir. And no one discontinued in this study so far due to CD4 or absolute lymphocyte uh, count decreases. Uh, in terms of safety, there were no grade three or four treatment-related adverse events. Uh, there were three serious adverse events in the Islatrovir, lenacapavir arms, uh, but they were not treatment-related. Uh, and those events were a perforated intestine and renal colic in a single person, uh, pneumonia, and what was described as a neurologic anesthetic complication. But there was one clinically significant laboratory abnormality, and that was a grade three ALT. And this person um, developed acute hepatitis B. So why is this important? Well, we have a two drug regimen here that doesn't cover hepatitis B. And in fact, none of the two drug regimens that we're looking at or that currently exist like dolutegravir 3TC, none of them cover hepatitis B. So please be sure that people are vaccinated. That is standard of care for people with HIV, but it's very important. And you should check it, to see that someone does not have hepatitis B before you put them on a two drug regimen. And if they do, they need to have another hepatitis B active drug in the regimen. So now we'll uh, go to a, the phase two study of daily Victegravir and Lenacapavir. And this was an interesting study. It is for people who are on therapy, but on a complex treatment regimen. And they define that uh, as a boosted PI or an NNRTI plus at least one other agent not in the NRTI, so not a, a nucleoside. 
uh, at least two pills uh, would qualify, or a parenteral regimen other than um, cabotegravir rilpivirine. And so these individuals who had suppressed virus were randomized to stay on their regimen or to go on to bictegravir at 75 milligrams, co-formulated with lenacapavir at 25 milligrams or lenacapavir at 50 milligrams. And then at week 24, there is an extension in which people have an opportunity to roll over onto open label um, bictegravir lenacapavir. And this is just an illustration of the diversity of these regimens. Gosh, we, we see our patients in here, don't we? The ones that have really complex regimens. Most of the um, individuals were on a PI, usually boosted darunavir and uh, dolutegravir, uh, plus or minus um, some nukes. But if you look on the left-hand side, they really were on a potpourri of regimens, some of which are quite complicated. And here are the virologic outcomes. Well, they were excellent at week 24. In both of the Bictegravir arms, 96% had uh, suppression below 50 copies, 100% uh, in the uh, background, in the, I'm sorry, in the baseline regimen arm, but that's not surprising in a switch study. Um, and then the CD4 cell count's a little bit difficult to interpret um, because that 50 milligram arm actually had lower CD4 cell counts uh, than the others. Um, but nonetheless, the 75 milligram, 50 milligram um, dose was chosen to go into phase three. So that is what we'll be looking at in phase three. Uh, in terms of treatment uh, emergent adverse events, uh, they were kind of smattered across the three arms. There were uh, a couple of events that led to discontinuation of study drug in the bictegravir lenacapavir arms, one in each of those arms, uh, nausea and vomiting. And I would just mention that um, there was one death in the study, not treatment uh, related, and that was due to coronary artery disease. Uh, and there were a few more treatment emergent adverse uh, events um, related to study drug in the 25 milligram lenacapavir arm. What about laboratory abnormalities? Uh, again, um, distributed across the groups, uh, there were grade three abnormalities uh, that were actually more common in the baseline regimen arm. Um, and then there were a couple of, there were some grade three and grade four events in the lenacapavir arms uh, that uh, were related to elevated creatinine. And these individuals we we're told had some degree of chronic kidney disease at baseline. So nothing really remarkable here. Uh, and this uh, regimen moves forward. And hopefully we'll see more about that uh, in the next uh, six months or so. Now let's look at lenacapavir plus a couple of broadly neutralizing antibodies. Uh, terapavimab and zinlirvimab, I've been practicing that. Uh, which we call TAB and ZAB now for obvious reasons, uh, were the BNABs. And people were randomized to be on lenacapavir plus uh, TAB at 30 milligrams per kilogram in both arms and ZAB at either 10 milligrams per kilogram or 30 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and I would just note that TAB and ZAB bind to the CD4 binding site of GP120 and the V3 glycan uh, in envelope. So this study was interesting um, because in order to qualify, the virus needed to be susceptible to either ZAB or TAB, but not both. And the reason is that about 50% of clade B viruses are susceptible to both TAB and ZAB, but 90% are susceptible to one or the other. And so this is a way, if it works, to widen the population that might be eligible to uh, receive this treatment. 
So this is a prior study that was recently published in Lancet HIV this year, uh, showing the data for those who were susceptible to both TAB and ZAB. Again, ZAB is at a 10 milligram or a 30 milligram per kilogram dose. And this is a very small study, so 10 people in each arm, but you can see that nine of those 10 uh, had suppressed viral load um, and that there was one person who did not have suppressed viral load uh, and rebounded during the study. It turns out when they went back on oral medicine, they did suppress, but this is a patient who had adequate lenacapavir, TAB, and ZAB levels and also had phenotypic sensitivity. So there is that gives pause. We don't know why this rebound occurred. Uh, now in the current study, the participants were randomized in a couple of ways. Uh, they were randomized to the dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram or 30 milligrams per kilogram for ZAB. And then they were randomized by susceptibility. So in each arm, they were balanced for TAB and ZAB susceptibility. And you can see on the right that um, these are the people who were susceptible to ZAB and these are those who were susceptible to TAB and no one was susceptible to both. And here are the results. Um, the 30 milligram per kilogram arm showed viral suppression in all six individuals. And the 10 milligram arm showed two individuals who had um, viral rebound above 50 copies or who were not suppressed below 50 copies. So it looks like the dose here may be important uh, and that will be looked at going forward. Uh, these compounds will go forward for further um, investigation. And I, I should mention that that would be a, a Q6 monthly uh, regimen. Uh, now let's look briefly at another presentation from Croy for an oral weekly INSTE, and that is 1720. And this is, um, an open label study looking at different doses of 1720. And uh, it is in people who had viremia, but less than 400,000 copies. They were treatment uh, naive, so never been treated before, or they had virus uh, and were treatment experienced um, and off antiretroviral therapy, but had never had an INSTE. So we're looking at a very small study, seven people in each dose level, and a short time point of um, 11 days. And here are the virologic results. So uh, at the end of 11 days, what you see is that actually all the doses did pretty well. Uh, 150, 450, and 900 exceeded a two log drop in viral load. Uh, the 450 and the 900 milligram doses um, had 100% uh, of patients reaching their target, uh, the target therapeutic range. Uh, and so far there has been no treatment emergent resistance, but they've only looked at the 150 and the 450 milligram arms. And now they are also doing resistance testing in the 30 milligram and the 900 milligram cohorts. So uh, this is a very interesting compound that we are going to see again. Um, and uh, it will be interesting to see how it plays out uh, in terms of um, weekly dosing. Here are the adverse events for this study. And you can see from all the zeros that uh, they were really um, fairly minor. Again, there are only seven people in each arm, um, but there really is no trend in terms of dose uh, with adverse events. And now let's turn to some BNABs. Uh, this is a very interesting area of investigation. There are a lot of BNABs out there and they're being looked at in all sorts of ways. Um, 
uh, treatment, prevention, cure. So we're going to look at the treatment studies today. And first we'll look at the um, study that was presented at CROI for N6LS, which is a CD4 binding BNAB. This study looked at people with no prior antiretroviral therapy uh, who had a reasonable CD4 count of 250 or above. And the earlier part of this study showed that um, it was well tolerated, uh, both IV and subcutaneously. And this was a study in which uh, the antibody susceptibility was performed retrospectively. And this area of susceptibility to BNABs turns out to be quite an important thing. And I think we'll learn a whole lot more as we go forward about how to manage this. Now, here is the study design. Uh, it's part one and part two, with part one being a single N6LS infusion at a dose of 40 milligrams per kilogram uh, or four milligrams per kilogram. And these are given IV. And again, there's small numbers of patients in each arm, eight in the 40 arm and six in the four arm. And then part two moves to different doses. So 70 milligrams, which is one milligram per kilogram, so a lower dose IV, plus 700 milligrams, which is 10 milligrams per kilogram uh, at uh, um, the highest dose IV. I have to say, I think it's a little confusing how this is presented, um, but we're gonna talk more about milligrams per kilogram. Um, and then there is the subcutaneous arm at the 10 milligram per kilogram dose. And you'll notice there is a direct comparison uh, with an IV dose um, at the same level. And there's 16 people in each of these arms. So first, let's talk about the subcutaneous antiviral activity. Um, I am sorry to say that it was underwhelming. Um, this was not really a surprise because uh, subcutaneous dosing is subject to first-pass lymphatic elimination, uh, but the 10 milligram per kilogram dose, which is that 700 milligram dose pointed out with the orange arrow, really only achieved about a half log of viral load reduction. And that's compared to about one and a half logs with an IV dose at the same dose level. Uh, it had um, a time to nadir of about nine days, uh, but then a time to rebound of about 17 days. So there was a lower subcutaneous uh, exposure than for IV exposure at the same dose. And now let's look at the IV doses here. And you'll see that the uh, dose with the largest viral nadir was the 40 milligram per kilogram IV dose. And that is in the light green over here. And it appears still to be going down some at day 14. Um, in fact, it was 16 days to the nadir and about 35 days to rebound. And this is compared, um, you can see that 700 milligram dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram right here in the black line. Now, a poster presented the SPAN study, which was looking at higher doses, both IV and sub-Q, and the sub-Q dose used that hyaluronidase again. Uh, now, these were in people without HIV, I should say. And in the sub-Q arm, there were a lot of injection site reactions. However, they were mild and they were tolerable in contrast to the cabotegravir sub-Q with hyaluronidase. And so the higher doses of 60 milligrams per kilogram IV and 40 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneous are moving forward uh, in the EMBRACE study. And this is a phase 2B study, and it doses N6LS IV every four months, 
plus cabotegravir every month and compares that to N6LS with hyaluronidase subcutaneous every four months with cab every month. So this will be very interesting to particularly to see how the subcutaneous dose fares going forward. Now I wanna go through a few more BNAB studies. Uh, first of all, this is an ACTG phase two study of VRC 07523LS. I know it's a mouthful. Um, and that was administered with cabotegravir. There were 74 people in this study and they presented week 44 results. Uh, the BNAB was dosed every eight weeks and CAB was dosed once monthly. And in this study, individuals were pre-screened for viral susceptibility uh, to the BNAB um, and also of course, resistance to cabotegravir. Uh, and it turned out that about 7% had virologic failure. And this was in spite of good levels for cabotegravir and the BNAB. And that is somewhat disappointing. Um, and there was one individual who had a high IC50. Uh, it was within the susceptibility range, but it was the highest of the group. And that individually uh, individual selected for an R263K mutation, which is a nasty NST mutation, uh, basically having been on monotherapy cabotegravir. And this emerged at virologic failure. So uh, there are some red flags uh, in this study. Next, we saw uh, a triple combination three BNABs infused every four weeks, and this was during uh, a treatment interruption. And in this study, there was retrospective susceptibility testing. And so uh, there were only 12 people in the study uh, who um, uh, were looking out for virologic response. And it turns out that 83%, so 10 out of 12, uh, maintained virologic suppression during a 28-week period when dosing occurred. And a third of uh, all of the people in the study or in the who uh, were in this part of the study uh, maintained viral suppression at 48 weeks. And that was after the dosing period. The third study of interest um, is a tri-specific BNAB. So instead of three BNABs, each targeting one different area, this is one BNAB that is engineered to be uh, tri-specific, looking at three different targets. And in this study, which was largely PK, uh, there were seven individuals who had viremia, and unfortunately, um, this was a single dose study, by the way, but the viral load reduction was entirely underwhelming. So 0.7 to 0.38 logs, so not a very good viral load reduction. So I think these BNABs are really interesting. I think they have a niche, but I don't quite know what it is yet. The responses are not quite as good as we see with oral therapy. Uh, it's very important to be screening for susceptibility. Um, and so I think we have um, a lot to learn here. I wanna show you one more BNAB study. This was a poster that was presented looking at two BNABs, uh, TMB365, which binds to the second domain of CD4. And then uh, TMB380, which is actually the same BNAB we've been talking about, VRC07523 LS, and that also binds to CD4 uh, binding site envelope. And there were 30 people in the study. They were dosed with three different doses uh, of the BNABs, uh, 2400, 3200, and 4800 milligrams. In this study, there were no grade three or four adverse events or serious adverse events. 
there were five mild to moderate infusion reactions, and the PK was suitable for dosing every eight weeks, uh, and this will be going into phase two. And you see the PK curves here with the target uh, as the purple line in each graph. And you see at the arrow, uh, the time point, uh, eight week time point, uh, and you can see that the concentration curves are above the target uh, area or at the target area for both of the BNABs. So this will be interesting to see going forward. Now we'll close with a really, really rapid roundup of some other drugs that are largely deep in the pipeline. Um, I wanna mention implants because everybody's interested in this implant idea. Um, first of all, there was an implant study at Croy in women without HIV who were um, in uh, the Caprisa group. Uh, and it turns out, unfortunately, that this TAF implant was not tolerable. Um, there were local reactions and about a third of them had to be removed. And likewise, drug delivery was lower than expected. So this implant did not work out uh, in this particular study. However, there was a preclinical study, uh, a couple of posters here for a dolutegravir implant. This was in mice, okay, mice are not people. Um, it delivered adequate levels of drug for six months. It is biodegradable and removable, which are attributes that people like about implants so that you can get rid of them if you don't like them uh, or if there is toxicity. So this will be moving forward, uh, we hope, um, into actual human beings. So I wanna just remind us all about um, the process of HIV maturation. So remember that um, maturation actually uh, occurs outside the cell and we have a variety of maturation inhibitors that have been looked at and they block the capsid SP1, uh, they block processing for capsid SP1. And they um, then prevent this immature virion from becoming a mature virion with a nice, beautiful capsid. So this virion remains immature and not infective. And so, uh, we do have one maturation inhibitor in phase two. This is um, 937 from Vive. Uh, and I, I just remind you that previous maturation inhibitors have failed for a variety of reasons, um, susceptibility, tolerance, potency, PK, half-life. They're kind of difficult as a class. Uh, if you remember Viveramat or GSK254, they are both um, maturation inhibitors that didn't quite make it out of phase two. There has been a phase one first in human study of this compound, uh, not in people with HIV, and it showed a terminal half-life of about three days. So that is very interesting and makes it suitable for once weekly oral dosing. Uh, there were no dose-limiting safety findings in this particular study. Uh, there also was a poster at Croy having to do with resistance, um, uh, and it was um, in vitro resistance that showed um, activity against many of the polymorphisms in GAG, and, um, but maybe not the best activity against uh, the sentinel maturation inhibitor um, resistance mutation, but we'll see as this goes along because it is in a phase two study now, small, 26 people uh, looking at activity, safety, and PK in people with HIV who have had no prior treatment. And this is an eight-day monotherapy versus placebo study. We also have a couple of capsid inhibitors um, in phase two, uh, also from Vive. Uh, these are in a 10-day monotherapy study in people with HIV with no prior treatment, and this study is comparing different doses of these two capsid inhibitors. There is an oral weekly in NRTI 
5894 in phase one. Uh, again, people with HIV, no prior treatment, very small, 13 people, a 10-day monotherapy study looking at PK dose and antiviral activity. Um, in the preclinical work on this compound, it appears to be active against many of the NNRTI-resistant viruses. So uh, again, no data on this one, uh, but uh, a lot of interesting oral weekly compounds, right? Uh, what about NSTs? Turns out there are a number of them. Um, 184 is in a phase 2A trial. It is being looked at as possible injectable compound uh, six months or longer. Uh, the proof of concept study just began in February. It will enroll 28 people. And these are people with HIV with no prior treatment. And again, a 10-day monotherapy versus placebo study. So um, very early. There also is an ultra long acting prodrug of Bictegravir that is in preclinical development now. Um, it's being looked at for possible every six months dosing. But what I thought was interesting is that instead of the very long PK tail that we see with Cabotegravir, it has a short PK tail. Um, now this is a rat and macaque study. But just look at this. So over a period of six months, it's uh, fairly stable. And then it nosedives very acutely over a couple of weeks uh, as, as it wears out um, instead of going on for a year or years. So I think that is interesting. Don't know what it means. Uh, there are a couple of early stage compounds, uh, 1219 and 3242 uh, that Gilead is looking at for possible six month or longer injections. And there is an ultra long acting prodrug of cabotegravir that is in clinical development, also being looked at for six months or longer um, uh, dosing. And this is uh, has promising PK in rats and beagle dogs. And then finally, there is a protease inhibitor uh, called GS9770. And this is interesting because it's an unboosted protease inhibitor. So, uh, you know, it's been a long time since we saw an unboosted protease inhibitor. Um, it's a guanidine-based uh, inhibitor rather than the aspartic protease inhibitors that we are um, familiar with. Its preclinical PK uh, looked good with a long half-life of 6 to 12 hours. And in vitro activity um, looked promising against many of the darunavir and adazanavir resistant mutants. So stay tuned for this one. So where are we in 2024? Much less interest in once daily drugs. And those are really slowing down and, and uh, not, not going to see very many of them in the near future. But we do have new strategies, oral weekly dosing. It'd be interesting to see how people respond to that. Uh, people are, are going to be seeing long-acting injectables. The companies are aiming for at least three-month dosing intervals. And sub-Q injection is still being looked at. It's less feasible as the volume increases uh, because of all those injection site reactions and also because of some absorption and metabolism issues. The goal here, of course, is self-injection. Uh, the BNABs, I think, are still looking for their niche. And there are lots of promising compounds in the pipeline for 2025 uh, and beyond. Cost continues to be a challenge, and this is an opportunity for advocacy folks. Uh, and equity of access must be prioritized to end the epidemic in all people. So I'll say thanks to the uh, folks who participated in this clinical trial, these clinical trials who ran them, uh, to the pharma colleagues who shared slides. And I wanna thank advocates who lobbied Congress to protect the HIV budget uh, for Ryan White, NIH, CDC, HRSA, and PEPFAR. Really important stuff going on with advocacy. So let's run through our post-test questions, okay? So please uh, vote on these again, and we'll see if anything changes. Um, once weekly, lenacapavir, bictegravir, showed 96% viral suppression in persons without prior treatment. B, once daily, Duravirinus latrovir at 0.25 milligrams 
showed a 30 cell decrease in CD4 count at 48 weeks. C, GS1720 is an oral integrase trans strand transfer inhibitor with a half-life supporting weekly dosing. And the NNRTI, um, uh, I'm sorry, NRTI inhibitor um, MK8507 causes lymphopenia when given with this latrovir. I getting, I'm getting messed up with all the numbers and uh, letters too. Let's see how you voted. Okay, so uh, basically this, oops, let's close this out. The correct answer is C. Um, GS1720 is an oral NST with a half-life supporting weekly dosing. Um, I tricked you, uh, lenacapavir bictegravir is once daily, not once weekly. Uh, and these were people on um, complex regimens. Deraverine is latrovir. That dose that caused lymphopenia was 0.75, not 0.25. Uh, and lymphopenia was caused by is latrovir, not MK8507. And the final question, go ahead and vote. Which of the following is currently entering clinical trials for HIV prevention? Uh, lenacapavir is latrovir, MK8527, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, MK8507, an NNRTI, or uh, GS9770, a protease inhibitor. Go ahead and vote. And let's see how the votes look. Okay, so uh, yeah, most of you got this right. Uh, the correct answer is B, um, MK8527 is the NRTTI that is currently entering clinical trials for HIV prevention. Um, given orally once a month. Uh, lenacapavir is in prevention studies, but not lenacapavir is latrovir. And then the other two are not in prevention trials. So um, now I have boggled your mind with numbers and letters uh, and let's go to q and I'll turn it back over to Raj. Perfect. Thank you for that really um, engaging and insightful um, presentation. I the, the words terapevimab and zinlirvimab just tripped off your tongue so easily. It's <laughs> very impressive. So um, a number of questions. I'm going to go through ones that I'm seeing in the uh, Q&A, and, and I'll direct them towards you. And, and then there's a couple from before as well that I picked out. Let's start with the very first drug you you talked about, which is the ultra-long-lasting cabotegravir intramuscular, um, the one that lasts four months. Uh, is that the same formulation as that original cabotegravir that we use um, for pre-exposure prophylaxis and just a different dose, or did they kind of alter the cabotegravir to make it longer lasting, modify it? Yeah, it's it's not the same. So don't try just giving a higher dose of the same old thing. Um, first of all, it might not be well tolerated, um, but actually they, they didn't give us a lot of specificity about how they um, created this new compound, but it does have a more concentrated dose. So for a given volume, which is usually like three milliliters, you can deliver a much higher dose. So um, the, it is a different compound, but there was not a lot of specificity about what made it different. Do you have any intel on whether this will be a, a drug for prevention, um, kind of a longer lasting pre-exposure prophylaxis, or is there a potential for treatment? I, I noticed the N6LS with that hyaluronidase uh, <laughs> in the race trial also was going to be tested every four months, although the cabotegravir was once a month. But any insight about whether ultra-long-lasting cabotegravir will be a preventive drug versus a part of a um, component of a treatment? Um, my understanding is that it could be preventative as well as treatment. 
Okay. So, you know, remember, we're early days with this. So we're really in phase one. Um, and, you know, I didn't say this, but I think we all know that um, most of the drugs that come into the pipeline actually don't work uh, and they fall out. So we've gotten excited so many times about drugs uh, too early in the pipeline. But, but you know, we know a lot about cabotegravir now. Uh, and so uh, it, it will be in phase one. It's going to have to prove itself as a Q4 month injection. Um, but I think it does have a leg up because we know so much about the drug already. Speaking of drugs that we're still learning about, um, Dr. Claudia Cortez is asking about um, not Zlatravir itself, I think, but the Zlatravir pro drug. So you you just very briefly mentioned there's a, a Zlatravir pro drug, a GS1614, I think I saw on your slide, mm -hmm. that might be studied every three months. And I guess the concern that Dr. Cortez is raising is what we just learned about is Zlatravir. Um, what are our concerns about this pro drug and and CD4 drop lymphopenia, or, or do we just not? Know? I think we care about it. I I think that yeah. was really the Achilles heel for is Latravir at the original doses. Um, it's encouraging that so much work has been done to try to figure this out uh, and to look at triphosphate levels and how to dose in order to decrease the accumulation of triphosphates. So I, I we know nothing, I know nothing, I'm sure somebody knows something, but I know nothing about this pro-drug. I wanted to include it just to pique your interest, um, but I think one of the most important things about this pro-drug will be um, being sure that it is delivering an acceptable amount of drugs so that the triphosphate levels don't get overwhelming to the cells and don't accumulate at a very high rate. You know, I'll point out that with MK8527, uh, actually the triphosphate accumulation appeared to be modest. So I think the chemistries can differ and make a big uh, a big difference in, in the triphosphate accumulation. So I, I think it's a great question and we'll see. Yeah, and obviously with the weekly dosing where we got data this year um, with the Zlatravir, they have a dose that looks good uh, in terms of weekly dosing of Zlatravir. So if that pro drug maybe has a different accumulation as you're saying, or just a different level, and maybe they'll, they'll have legs, so we'll see. Um, the um, um, Dr. David Kassane points out, and I just to maybe clarify, the, the Tegravir Lenacapavir study, um, which was, if I understood it right, is for complicated regimens, you know, for simplification from complicated regimens. That's Tegravir without any FTC tap. That's so that has that same concern you highlighted with Zlatravir Lenacapavir, the, the weekly one, uh, where there was the acute Hep B. That, that lesson of immunize your patients uh, also is going to apply to the Bictegravir lenacapavir because it's without TAF. Yeah, I, I think that's so important to point out. You and I've talked about that, Raj. Um, you know, we also see that in people who are transitioning to cabotegravir ropivirine. Um, and everybody is worried about resistance and we do all of those tests, but sometimes people forget to check about hepatitis B. And so there are um, accumulating cases of hepatitis B, um, acute hepatitis B from acquisition, but also hepatitis B flares because people come off of their TAF containing regimens uh, onto a two drug regimen that has no coverage at all for hepatitis B. And then uh, we see hepatitis B flares. So I think, you know, right now I'm not aware of a two drug regimen in the pipeline that actually has an active hepatitis B drug, no tenofovir containing compounds that I'm aware of. So I, I do think this is just a red flag for us when we start thinking about simplification. It's very seductive to simplify, um, but uh, we have to do the homework. Go that Ashma. And actually, this might be a good opportunity to state that we also learned at CROI this year, we had learned earlier that the Hep B CPG vaccine, um, which goes by the trade name of Peplosab, looked good for initial vaccination in terms of um, a good seroprotective response. But we learned at CROI that even in vaccine non-responders, those patients who have tried to vaccinate with um, the alum containing Hep B vaccine and just didn't get a take, that uh, a good number of them, actually more than 90% of them had 
response when they got the Hep B CPG. So that's a good um, thing to tuck away and, and try to implement. Um, and let me tag on and say that um, they looked at three doses. Uh, so two doses are sort of the standard regimen for that vaccine. And they looked at three doses and um, got extraordinary responses. I mean, um, and and had a lot of people, like 80%, had very high viral load, uh, antibody, here I'm talking about viral load, but antibody titers against hepatitis B. And we don't know what those titers greater than 1,000 actually mean, but it seems to be a very immunogenic vaccine. And so something that I would consider for people who have very low CD4 counts and you don't expect them to go up, you're not just starting them on antiretroviral therapy, but you know people who have, have low CD4s, who have viremia, who, have, uh, who are older perhaps, there were very few people in that category in this particular study at Croy, but, um, but an important group to think about. Maybe a little time now on BNABs. Um, the BNAB studies look provocative, but then there were these kind of unexplained cases almost of people who broke through despite having good levels of BNABs. Um, one question um, is, were there particular weight criteria for the BNAB trials? I think the particular study that was being um, commented on was, was the Banner study, the and six LS, but um, I, I went and looked at your slides and I didn't see a weight on that weight criterion on there, but it seems like an important thing to consider. Yeah, I think it is an important thing to consider. Um, and I, I don't think there was a weight criteria. I'll have to go back and, and look at the study more carefully, but um, I think some of these really are yet unexplained. And there was some sense from the lenacapavir to be NAB study, Zab and Tab, that maybe a higher dose could get around some of this. And, you know, they, we have these susceptibility cutoffs, but I don't know how accurate they are. Um, you know, we, we may, as we give more drug to more people, learn that the susceptibility cutoffs should be different. And I think, um, most of these BNABs are going to require susceptibility screening up front. And that adds a little cost to yeah. a regimen and it adds time. And so I think that will be a bit of a downside for BNABs wherever we end up using them. But... Yeah, I, I think I totally agree. And actually the, the delivery is, is not simple with IVs or even subcutaneous with the hyaluronidase. One really exciting idea, but it's not quite here yet, is whether you can use a harmless viral vector to deliver it over the course of a year or more. Um, there was some uh, studies, not this year, but, but we'll see. What I li like about them is you can engineer them, but how they'll play out is still to be determined. So now in the last five minutes, we're going to go to the crystal ball phase of the uh, presentation. So we're going <laughs> to ask you to pull out your crystal ball. Um, any advances in patches, uh, especially useful in kids? Um, I didn't see anything at Croy, but I might've missed them. Uh, yeah, I might've missed them too. And quite honestly, I didn't look at all the pediatric work, yeah. but um, but I didn't see anything particularly in kids. You know, generally these studies start in adults and, you know, they generally start with safety and efficacy and so on in adults. I know that patches are being looked at, um, but I believe they are at this point in adults, and I don't think we have a lot of data, and I certainly didn't see anything at Croy this year. And any um, um, estimates, guesses as to resistance and when any of, the, any of these drugs have a particularly high resistance barrier, or is the proof going to be in the pudding and we just have to wait and see in terms of resistance barrier? Yeah, you know, I, I think there is a wait and see part of that. Um, we can do all sorts of in vitro stuff, and sometimes we're um, surprised when these drugs actually get into humans. Um, the NRTTIs tend to have a pretty high resistance barrier. Um, you know, I, I will say this about lenacapavir. I think lenacapavir is a little more genetically fragile than we had initially hoped. Um, but, you know, part of that depends on having a strong backbone to put it in with, um, because you, you can't just let lenacapavir hang out there all by itself, because you clearly will get um, the selection of resistance. Um, but there also are drug-drug interactions with lenacapavir that I think are very important. And 
again, as I always say about drug drug interactions, just look them up, you know, go to the Liverpool website and look them up because you cannot remember all of these things. But, you know, sometimes I, I worry that there's going to be Lena Capavir on board and we're going to forget about it because we only give it every six months and people go to see a consultant and, you know, they're, they don't really understand what's going on. There is a potential for drugs to be given that could lower levels of Lena Capavir. Um, so I think we're going to have to be vigilant about drug drug interactions um, and and also viral load testing to be sure we're not letting people um, sit on a rising viral load for too long. Just because you can give a drug every six months doesn't mean that you shouldn't monitor people more frequently. Let's have the last question be one that I think really would be amazing, but I wonder if there's any, what you know about anything on the horizon. Are there any drugs, um, uh, formulations combining HIV drugs with drugs for substance use disorder or or any HIV drugs that might have an impact on substance use disorder? I'm, I'm not aware of an HIV drug that has substance use disorder effects, but, but maybe there is, or anything that we can combine with um, substance use disorder drug. Yeah, so I am not aware of those those combinations being looked at um, in clinical trials. I will say that treating the virus can be beneficial. Um, treating substance use can be beneficial for viral suppression. And so I do think they go hand in hand. I mean, it would be great if we had, you know, sort of one-stop shop um, with just one agent that actually could have an effect on both. I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, but I do think it's such an important question because we see over and over that when people actually have access to good treatment for substance use, when they have co-located care for substance use and HIV care, uh, they tend to do much better and their virus gets suppressed um, and you know they tend to thrive. And so I do think it's it's so important for these, treatments to be given together, even though they're not uh, single agents against both. And in that regard, the last IASUSA guidelines that were published on December 1st, 2022, has a really practical appendix where it talks about really best practices around um, treating substance use disorder in, in our patients with, with HIV. So if you haven't looked at that, that's, that's a really great resource um, in the, the JAMA article from December 2022. So with that, I think we're we're a little bit over the hour. So we'll, why don't we're over the quarter hour? So maybe we will go ahead and wind up, and I'll just go through just a few quick quick reminders, um, uh, evaluations, and information on how to claim CME and other credits um, will be emailed um, uh, on Monday, and you can see the time there. I want to underline the next um, comment, which is your feedback is incredibly important to us, so that we can continue and improve the delivery of the content we we strive to, to bring to you. So do take a moment to fill out the evaluations and uh, more information um, around the IAS um, the USA activities is on our website. A couple of um, uh, uh, programs we want to highlight. One is not a, is a podcast, actually. It's called Going Antiviral, which is a really clever uh, title. This is a new IAS USA podcast hosted by Dr. Mike Sag. There's a um, episode coming up on... Uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I think it's now sometimes called MASH. Um, and um, uh, and STI is a really, really important discussion coming up. And there's a, a kind of a library now of really good talks there. Uh, Croy was very, very um, uh, uh, rich this year in terms of really good content. Um, you're going to hear some summaries of Croy. That, uh, you see one coming up on April 12th with Dr. Dar and Courier. Um, so join that one. Uh, as well as um, a focused one on uh, the art of HIV and STI prevention uh, with Drs. Uh, Bookbinder and Lou. Um, implementation science and the optimization of HIV care. Um, what's all the buzz about with um, Dr. Okeke and Dr. Eaton? And if you are or can get yourself to Atlanta, uh, Georgia, you'll have a really terrific uh, course on April 18th. Um, uh, and you see the uh, list of topics there. So um, that's a, a course with a really outstanding faculty listed on this slide as well. And Chicago, um, similar um, uh, types of topics, but with a, a somewhat different faculty. And for those um, 
who can get there, you'll definitely uh, find it rewarding for May 16th, 2024. And with that, I think we're going to wrap it up and thank you all for participating. And a special thanks to Dr. Thompson for her presentation and to ISUSA staff for um, organizing this great webinar. Thank you all. Thank you all for participating. Thank you.